I'm Evan Feigenbaum, the Vice President for Asia at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. When the story of COVID-19 is written, both epidemiologists and historians will agree that some places perform better than others. And one of the highest performers will have been Taiwan, a place that combined social behavior with the innovative use of technology and big data and a rich store of experience and lessons learned from its fight in 2003 against another coronavirus, severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. Steve Guo was the coordinator of Taiwan's SARS task force in 2003, who went on to become twice the director of Taiwan's Centers for Disease Control. He's been involved in every aspect of Taiwan's fight against infectious diseases over the years. So we talked to him about what Taiwan had learned from the SARS experience, how it had combined the use of technology with social behavior to deal with COVID-19, and what the world could learn from Taiwan's experiences too. Dr. Guo, I'd like to start with the experience with SARS in 2003, because you were so centrally involved with it as the coordinator of Taiwan's SARS task force. What was the state of Taiwan's preparedness at the time? And in particular, what did Taiwan learn from that experience that changed its system, both in terms of governance and public health, and became useful in the run-up to COVID-19? Many lessons learned. For instance, uh, during the SARS outbreak, uh, we have a serious mass shortage. So we established a national, national stockpiles for masks, PPE, and all sorts of things. And actually, so we required the hospital to have a, a one-month uh, reserve uh, uh, for uh, medical equipment, you know, every hospital. And then the local, uh, local government need to uh, have a reserve and the stockpile for another two months. Uh, for every hospital under his jurisdictions. And then the, uh, the, na na the central governments need to uh, stockpile another uh, two months of uh, medical supply for whole nations. And so uh, uh, later on, we don't have this uh, worry about the shortage. And that's one thing. And, so, and secondly, hospital infection, because during the SARS outbreak, we have a one hospital got a very uh, serious the hospital you know so community infections which results many healthcare uh, providers uh, death and so uh, we learned that that uh, hospital uh, infection control is very important and uh, 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 later so we amend the law we required hospital you know to have a uh, hospital infection control committee and uh, uh, which needs to be a uh, chair by the superintendent or the deputy superintendent. So we make hospital infection control as the number one uh, priority uh, after the SARS outbreak. And then uh, certainly uh, commanding centers, which is very important. During the SARS outbreak, uh, there's a, a dispute between the authority, between the central government and the local governments, okay? And later we know that uh, that's very bad for a, uh, fighting a disease, uh, like infectious disease, you need a centralized uh, control system. So uh, we amend uh, the Communicate Disease uh, Control Act and they, we entrust the, the authority to the central uh, government. So during an outbreak, now the central government uh, have the say. I mean, uh, he can order the local governments to. Uh, do whatever uh, they uh, think need to do. If the local government uh, uh, didn't follow, uh, the law say the central governments can uh, take over. So in a sense, uh, the central government has the total authority uh, uh, during the uh, outbreak, uh, like uh, SARS or COVID-19. And so, and also, you know, that the, the public learned the lesson. So uh, in a way, this is like a social immunizer. They know something uh, happens, they need to take it very serious, uh, seriously from the day one. And that's uh, changed the system and people uh, understand uh, the investment uh, won't be waste. And actually, uh, you know, during uh, the, turn, uh, the, the years uh, after SARS, I almost tripled uh, Taiwan CDC budget, you know, 
because the uh, strong uh, political commitments. And so SARS, yes, uh, changed a lot. But not only SARS, I mean, uh, so right uh, after the SARS, uh, uh, we have uh, Ebola, uh, we have H1N1, we have H7N9, uh, uh, we have dengue, we have Zika. So every time uh, we learn something uh, from the outbreak. So let's fast forward to COVID-19. When an infectious disease breaks out, what does a well-prepared public health and government system do in response? And how did Taiwan's preparedness over many years affect its initial response to COVID-19? So it's really kind of this speed and the response that uh, uh, alarm the uh, society and uh, people get take it very seriously uh, in the very beginnings. But I think uh, the most the thing uh, is that you have a, a well uh, uh, performed systems uh, in place, you know, uh, with a centralized command uh, system uh, that uh, with a uh, commit uh, with a health minister who can communicate with people uh, in a daily uh, in, uh, uh, daily uh, uh, press conference. Doctor, well, I'd like to ask you about the use of technology in Taiwan, because I think when many outside observers look at how Taiwan has dealt with COVID-19, what they notice first is the innovative use of technology, the integration of national health and immigration databases, the use of aggressive contact tracing and testing. Can you talk a little bit about technology-based solutions and how technology has enabled Taiwan's response? We are lucky to have a single-payer national health systems, okay? Uh, which allow us to build a national health information system, okay, for many years, uh, with a unique ID, which can somewhat link other data, uh, data from immigration, uh, from police departments, so you can create this huge uh, uh, big data. And we use this big, uh, big data to do what? Uh, basically four things, okay? Uh, we can use this data uh, to identify uh, close contacts, you know, and then use this data uh, to enhance uh, the quarantine you know, uh, with a system that uh, we call it digital fencing systems, okay, with the GPA location and that sort of things. And, but also we can use the system, uh, the data, uh, to send a warning message to whatever the people who need to be warned, okay? And also we use this uh, big data uh, to protect the healthcare systems. For instance, every patient or visitor to a hospital, they need to show their uh, insurance ID card, which actually is contain uh, the information of travel and whether they are uh, sick or they are uh, from other, uh, uh, a, a medical institution, so hospitals can protect themselves by knowing every individual's, no matter is patients or the visitor outside. And so it's become a line of defense. And so that's where you, where we use the data. And I have to say that uh, technology is one thing, and I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of country can do uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this big data things as well, but I would say uh, using data, uh, the big data is more uh, more of a legal issues than a uh, technology issues. Uh, you have to understand that you know in Taiwan we also a uh, full democratic countries, and so there's a, there's a concern of uh, the privacy, and and so the Congress has the, the debate you know, how to utilize uh, all this, uh, you know, big data to merge in without a formal, a prior consent of individual, individual uh, patients. Just one last question. Obviously, every place in the world is not exactly like Taiwan, but I'm wondering if you can talk about what experiences and practices in Taiwan can become global best practices. In other words, what's the best of Taiwan's experience that can be exported and then scaled around the world to deal both with COVID-19 and with infectious disease outbreaks in the future? We are planning 
uh, to form a uh, Taiwan Pandemic Control Industry uh, Alliance. So, you know, we can ask all the, uh, you know, our uh, uh, companies, uh, industries, and also uh, Taiwan CDC and uh, academias uh, to share their experience and uh, in an integrated way uh, to other uh, countries. And so we are doing that now. Uh, but uh, one of the lessons we learned from SARS is that uh, you never, you know, celebrate or claim victory too early, okay? And we know that is only the third inning of the ninth inning game. So it's a long, we still have a long way to go. And uh, we can always learn uh, from each other. And that's, a, that's, that's, that's probably the most important things to know. Well, Dr. Guo, thanks so much for joining us and for telling us Taiwan's story. It's been a remarkable performance and the world has a lot to learn. Thanks so much.